Um, so the theme is love lost, love found, love lost, or the opposite. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be writing about married love. Um, so I think on any given day, you can go through that cycle several times. <laughs> Or even moment by moment, depending on whether there are dirty socks in the no dirty socks zone or somebody ac actually did the laundry and you weren't <laughs> expecting them to. So there's lots of ups and downs on a daily basis. Um, I'm going to be reading two poems and then two poems and then I have one long poem at the end. So I'm stretching the, the bounds a little bit here. But I, um, the first two poems are just sort of, I think, <coughs> feeling out the subject. Um, the, f uh, the very first one, though, I'm reading kind of for, for Stevie. It's, it's uh, called The Novel you wrote, That You Loved Last Fall. So that I had to do it for you for that. But also because it's the most recent thing I think I've finished. So, The Novel You Loved Last Fall is distilled now into its essence, stripped of plot, names, narrative arc, all but your hero's middle chapter call to his ex-wife. Top paragraph of a verso page. Not one word left, just the shape of her voice perfectly fitted to his inner ear, the old pang of her rejection and his breath steaming up the phone booth and condensing into rivulets. Above him, undescribed, clouds churn. There you go again, waiting for their rain to fall on you. <coughs> this is called Married Love. All of them are dead now. My father and mother bedded together under their matching stones, their married friends close by. The crystal and good plates all washed and put away in other homes. No party food left over. My job was to whip the cream for dessert and ride behind on their fishing weekends like a seventh wheel, along with our Airedale, who wore striped socks over his muddy paws in the house. <laughs> Spirits accelerated toward cocktail hour in the red ranch kitchen, where they made big to-dos over their drinks then feigned concern they might corrupt me. <laughs> the men stirred the air, clustered at the bar, moved among the women, conferring over the bubbling stew. My mother flushed and pretty as a cornucopia of summer fruit. That September before college, I joined the happy group on a fly fishing river in Montana and slept on the cottage's fold-out couch. Late one evening, lights doused, I was alone with mother and one of the men. Not quite uncle, not quite friend, though I newly recognized that he was handsome. I've erased whatever he said that convinced me he'd forgotten I was there. But there I was, afraid to breathe, confused to learn how delicately balanced these practitioners of marriage must be. Then they retired to their separate rooms, though a presence hung in the air like the perfume of a living thing. <laughs> Around 7.30, there was enough of a lull that Charles felt comfortable taking a break and entrusting the bar to his less experienced colleagues. A pair of over-caffeinated, undernourished graduate students, pre-law Patrick and biochemistry Kate. Because he considered it important to enforce a strict boundary between his dual identities, Charles the Pothead and Charles the Barkeep, he removed his monogrammed country club issue jacket and walked briskly to the 16th green to smoke a joint. By 7.45, he had taken a piss, 
freshened his breath with mouthwash, renewed the whites of his eyes with visine, and resumed his place behind the bar before any of the guests noticed he'd been gone. At least, that's what he thought. Returning to his battle-weary subordinates, Charles said, why don't you guys get some dinner? Just come back when you hear the band start up, okay? Reaching for his jacket, Charles noticed what looked like a small handkerchief tucked into the chest pocket. What's this? One of the waiters left it. Patrick raised an arm and pointed. That one. A guest asked, to del- asked him to deliver it to you. See you later. It was a gold-lettered cocktail napkin. Supple and soft, feeling more like cloth than paper, it was the same warm persimmon color as the bridesmaid's gowns and probably cost nearly as much. Megan and Kyle, together from this day forward, love life us up where we belong. (laughs) April 2, 1988. On the non-monogram side, in black ink, someone had written, Bartending exam. Number one, name the ingredients in a Moscow mule. The woman who wrote this message, and Charles knew it was a woman, not because of the handwriting, but because of the perfume, used a combination of print and cursive, a sure sign that she was younger than Charles, schooled at a time when learning cursive was no longer a priority. And yet somewhere along the way, she'd been exposed to the Palmer method. (laughs) The words bartending and Moscow made use of Mr. Palmer's distinct special variants for the letters G and W when located in the terminal position. (laughs) Charles perched on a bar stool, on a stool behind the bar and began to write. Two ounces vodka. It had been years since he'd written with the consciousness of technique. Juice of one half lime, one split ginger beer or ale, and being so out of practice, he was nervous. Combine and serve in beer mug with two cubes of ice. But at least he didn't have to improvise the content of his reply. Drop in lime shell. Charles examined his penmanship as if judging a blind submission to the National Palmer System handwriting competition. (laughs) Muscle memory had served him well. It was an acceptable effort. So he flagged down the waiter Patrick had pointed out and asked him to deliver the napkin to its sender. Charles tried to follow his figure through the crowd, but there were too many people, and the post-drink, post-dinner drink orders were starting to arrive. A few minutes later, another napkin arrived. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Number two, what is the proper glass in which to serve a Bacardi buck? Charles wrote his next response on a Broadmoor letterhead note card and then tucked it into an envelope addressed to examiner and posted it with the waiter mail carrier. (laughs) Another question, how do you make a blood and sand cocktail? Then another, how do you make an absinthe frappe, a Bobby Burns cocktail, a horse's neck, a maiden's prayer, a merry widow, a point of no return? Charles penned and posted his replies as quickly as he could. None of the questions ignited his imagination as much as, how do you make a between the sheets? (laughs) The questions kept coming until eventually Charles was in possession of a four by four inch cocktail napkin manuscript, (laughs) which he kept safe from spillage on a shelf behind the bar. And then, As the clock inched toward midnight and the band began its last set, the final question arrived. How do you make sense of the fact that you're working as a bartender? (laughs) 